Welcome to Tomorrow Never Knows with Bob Wilson and Sir Warren Brown of the Beatles Kingdom. Today we welcome Scott Marshall, who is bringing some Mr. Tambourine Man into the Beatles Kingdom. So greetings, everybody, and welcome, fellas. Welcome, uh, Warren. Say hello to Scott. Hi, Scott. How are you doing, my friend? I'm well, Warren. Thank you. And welcome to the show. And you know, we have to thank our sponsor. Beatles Magazine is a publication with 370 plus million visitors in all their pages, read by thousands of fans around the world every day. Beatles News is updated 24 hours with audio, video, photos, interviews, contests, additional materials, and more. So follow Beatles Magazine, the most complete online coverage, 24 hours a day and eight days a week. So Scott, I have to ask you, when did you start listening to Bob Dylan, and uh, when did you decide to work on this great book, Bob Dylan, A Spiritual Life? I first came into his music as a 19-year-old, and so I would be a second-generation fan because this was in mid-1980, so Dylan's albums, Empire Burlesque, Knocked Out Loaded, those were uh, had just emerged, and so uh, most, most people... Uh, you know, aren't aren't going to put those albums at the top of their list. So I I came in, you know, at that that period. But by as far as the book goes, though, if you fast forward into the 90s, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, it mutated. The book mutated from a series of online articles in 2003 and 2004. This website called Jews Week, which is no longer uh, in existence, they published a series of these articles, and then. Uh, for over a decade, the these, these series of articles became a, a book, uh, and uh, however, an unpublished manuscript. So for over a decade, I experienced some rejections, but uh, it finally saw the light of day in 2017. Well, it's a fascinating work. It was hard to put down. There's so much in there that I found interesting, but I'll get to uh, what I did find so interesting in the questions as we move along. Um, looking back on Bob Dylan's background, um, I think if we look at his work, as you detail so well in your book, uh, he was very interested in the Bible all along, I mean, going way back. Can you uh, speak a bit to the importance of Scripture before he had, like, the big public conversion in his work? Right. As far as that goes, sometimes it was overt, you know, pre-1979, let's say, Sometimes it was more indirect in, in the shadows. I mean, he's certainly someone who writes songs and plays the guitar and harmonica, and he's a, a band leader uh, first and foremost. But the, but from very early on, I mean, he, before he was uh, world famous, uh, questions of morality or things that that were whether direct or indirect biblically. Were, uh, I don't know if bothering him would be the right word, but but certainly on on his mind. And I'll just say that this this minister, this guy named Bert Cartwright, who passed away in 1996, and he he could he would have been uh, could have been Dylan's dad age wise. I think he was born in the mid 20s. Uh, anyway, he he wrote a book in 1985 called The Bible and the Lyrics of Bob Dylan, and he you know, cataloged uh, biblical references, whether from the Hebrew scriptures or the New Testament. And uh, it it was an incredible number of allusions, whether direct or indirect, you know, long before slow train coming. And so, but by the way, this Burt Cartwright guy uh, is someone whose main, a lot of his work included standing up and speaking out in the 1950s uh, in the South, you know, as far as civil rights and somebody turned him on to to Dylan's music. I think it was the mid '60s, and so I think Cartwright at the time was about 40 years old when he became introduced to Dylan's music. But anyway, so yeah, he ca- he's an important figure in terms of cataloging. Uh, one of the first there to really look at, you know, in terms of at least Dylan's lyrics, the biblical allusions. And going back even to the early songs, like the first few albums, it seems like. See that my grave is kept clean. Um, you know, other songs at that time had an apocalyptic nature. You know, the times they were changing, blowing in the wind, uh, came from the Bible. Hard rain certainly was apocalyptic. Um, so it seems he, to know those, to write those songs, you would need a knowledge of the scriptures. Am I wrong? Right. 
I, I think that's fair to say, and just his his Jewish upbringing was was highly significant, and he knew a good bit of Hebrew by the time of his bar mitzvah when he was 13 years old. This would have been you know mid 1950s, and so and he went to this camp and you know for five or six summers and this Jewish summer camp where you know he was formative years as far as him you know playing music and so forth but in terms of uh whether it was his father and mother uh in Minnesota you know his his native state uh and and this camp by the way was in uh Wisconsin but it wasn't too far away and so but but in terms of yeah the 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 words he was writing i mean you know it's pretty pretty amazing if you think about you know just something as simple but profound is i think it let me think you know that line where he says i can't think for you you'll have to decide whether judas iscariot had god on his side you know i mean any any 21 year old even thinking about that you know much less <laughs> putting putting it down as a lyric and then it becoming you know just part of his early body of work that's uh that's saying you know that, that old saying that does anyone have does a singer does he or she have something to say well dylan definitely maybe before that phrase came into vogue he 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 had something to say and it wasn't just you know it's not only i i i think i maybe don't acknowledge enough it's not like he's just only writing and singing about spiritual or religious topics i mean it's all manner of things that we encounter as human beings but certainly you cannot deny, uh, like if someone was, let's put it this way, for whatever reason, if someone was unaware of the Bible, uh, they'd be missing a whole lot, you know, uh, in terms of Dylan's lyrics from, from the get-go. Well, in the book, I was interested in reading, like, the quotes you had from Mavis Staples and, say, Maria Muldauer, and they were saying things like they believed Bob was anointed before he knew it. And I think it was Pop Staples that Mavis quoted and said she thought he he was just given a gift to write these words down and he didn't completely grasp it. Do you want to speak a little to that thread? Sure. Sure. I think that that was interesting because his relationship, uh, Mavis Staples, it seemed like in more recent years in the last decade or two, has talked about quite a bit just how they met. You know, I think it was at the Newport Folk Festival. And, uh, and yes, what her, her dad said about Dylan's gift. And I know, you know, fast forward to early 2000s when Dylan was working on his, uh, uh, whether it's a memoir or somewhat of an autobiography, not really actually, but, but Chronicles anyway, that, that he, that was published in 2004. Some of those interviews that Dylan gave around that time and leading up to it, you know, he spoke about, a God-given destiny to do what he does, you know, basically writing songs and performing them. Uh, and even, I remember one interview, I think it was 2001, he says something like, you know, Edison did what he did, you know, the Wright brothers did what they did, you know, this was this was my thing, you know. <laughs> so he kind of lumped himself in with some, some somewhat significant figures as far as, uh, you know, this, this destiny, you know, and I think, so yeah, he might not have, he likely didn't know it at the time, or at least fully know it, like anyone, right? We're just, uh, as, as we're going through life, sometimes it's uh, muddling your way through and things get revealed to you. You have certain experiences, and 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 so there's that. Well, it was interesting, I thought, too, when your book spoke of Billy Graham, and it really spans the time, I mean, spans the decades. He went back and said, he saw Billy Graham in the 50s or 60s, and he was the first rock star, you know, more than Mick Jagger, more than Bruce Springsteen. He gave him quite a buildup in the AARP interview. Um, and later, like you had told me, he had Dylan had seen uh, Billy Graham in Baltimore in 1981. Uh, could you speak a little bit about Dylan's, you know, view on Billy Graham and how far back that goes that he was interested in him and liked him? Right, that was just something, I don't know if crazy is the right word, but I just know when you mentioned that AARP, I just became aware that, oh, okay, Dylan's about to, or this interview appeared in this, you know, retired 
Retired Folks Magazine, 2015. I think the interview was in late 14. But to my knowledge, Dylan had never publicly anyway uh, mentioned Billy Graham. And then all of a sudden, you know, here Dylan is in his, uh, let me do the math, I guess you have mid-70s. And, you know, the the interview was wide-ranging, but he did, he he talked for a bit about Billy Graham. And it was incredible. It was just humorous, just the way Dylan, you know, he's the, the, the humor thing is huge. If I, I would argue that, you know, you can't, if you take away the humor and the wit and the spirituality as well, uh, you take away a whole lot. And it was just humorous the way he described, like you said, he, he was saying that Billy Graham filled up stadiums, you know, more than the New York Giants did, you know, and, and, and just the way he described him uh, to, to parallel him really to the spirit of rock and roll. And he talked about how, you know, he, you know, there were people that got their souls saved and, and he heard them loud and clear. I mean, this is Dylan talking. And like you said, he, in this interview, and of course there's always this thing as Dylan for real, right. In an interview just dating back to the mid sixties and this, this image that's hard to shake, but who knows, maybe he was in the fifties or sixties, uh, saw Billy Graham. And just because, you know, it hasn't been documented all the people that have scoured it, life public and private for decades there's of course many things that uh that uh we're not going to be aware of, of of any individual but uh but yeah fast forward it it def, definitely dylan in 1981 went to a billy graham crusade and i only found that out through this woman uh jess archer uh who wrote a book that came out a few years ago about her experience growing up in the billy graham she was just a traveling gypsy, basically, with her, her dad worked for the Billy Graham, and they went from town to town. And uh, anyway, but it's definitely, if you check, I, I mean, I I did, did a bunch of confirmation, and uh, sure enough, when Dylan was in doing some U.S. dates in the summer of 81, like you said, and it was in uh, Columbia, uh, Maryland, and uh he, I mean, that's that's the what he called. Dylan was playing a concert there, but the night before, I just I, looked it up. So it was June fourteenth, uh, nineteen eighty one, at Merriweather Post Pavilion. There you go. Yeah, the night before, then June thirteenth, Billy Graham was in the middle of this. You know, I think it was a week or two of uh, crusades at the Baltimore Orioles Stadium, and so Dylan was right there in the area, and uh, and this Jess Archer recounts how her dad. Uh, you know, that someone, um, you know, came up, Dylan was with someone else and wanted to possibly speak to Billy Graham, which didn't actually happen. Uh, but uh, so this was Dylan, you know, basically had just turned 40 years old. He was, you know, the slow train coming and saved album, you know, had just been out. And uh, uh, so he wasn't in terms of Dylan's, uh, he had taken a, a hit, you know, definitely as in terms of uh, among a number of fans and critics in, in terms of uh you know just the, the the christian the christian sentiments uh you know weren't weren't fully embraced by uh you know tons of fans uh not not to say that he didn't pick up some christian fans along the way and so forth but anyway but yeah so it's interesting so for future researchers you know somebody needs to you know just simply next person that interviews dylan she was just just I'd be curious just to know, like, when he saw Billy Graham, what that context was in the 50s or 60s, so anyway. As you were saying, uh, Dylan put out three what they call overt Christian records, you know, where he comes right out. It's a Christian album, like a gospel album. Um, it was a heavy witness at the concerts during that period. Uh, he came right out and preached, basically. Can you, you had alluded to it a minute ago, but can you describe the reaction of the rock critics and the fans to all this suddenly happening and how quickly did it seem to happen? Right. Well, he, you know, there were some rumors and the, I mean, there were some accounts and some at the, at the time it would have been, you know, I think there was something in the Washington post and probably Rolling Stone magazine as in terms of Dylan attending Bible classes and that there was some album he was recording. This was in 1979, early in spring 79 and so, you know, by the time Slow Train Coming came out, which was late summer of 79 in August, you know, he, 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 uh, 
Saturday Night Live, of all places, uh, you know, it was a very popular show uh, just getting off. It had been in existence a few years. And so here Dylan is debuting these, uh, this gospel album of his, Slow Train Coming, on Saturday Night Live. And within a couple of weeks, he's doing, that was his live debut, was on television, a few of the songs. But then fast forward to within a couple of weeks, he's in San Francisco for these two weeks of shows at the Warfield Theater uh, in the heart of downtown San Francisco. And he did two weeks of shows there where he only played his new gospel material. And so people have followed his career are very, very aware of this. But in terms of the the reaction, I mean, the San, you know, I've come to find out that, you know, the San Francisco Chronicle, for example, was easily the most widely circulated newspaper. So, you know, their rock critic at the time, music reviewer Joel Selvin, who wrote for the San Francisco Chronicle for decades, he he's still, he just wrote a book on, not too long ago, on the Altamont Festival in 69. But so anyway, but Selvin wrote this review uh, of this opening night review that was entitled Bob Dylan's God Awful Gospel. That was the headline. And I later discovered that, oh, just because he wrote the article doesn't mean he wrote the headline, Journalism 101, at least back in that day. And so, but he he basically, uh, you know, it was a very negative review still. And, you know, by, let's see, a, say a decade or so later, when one of the Dylan biographies came out, you know, just even the, this this article, this review was, you know, included in the biography because it was a, you know, it was apparently syndicated since the Chronicle had, you know, major circulation, and it pissed Dylan off. I mean, there's no question about that. I mean, he, he, uh, let's see, he talked from the stage about it from, you know, on occasion, like around that time period, and even in '85, uh, you know, he's in Biograph, this compilation, this five album, three CD deal. He was he was talking about some of that resistance he experienced in in terms of the press. But anyway, real funny story that I got an interview from Joel Sullivan's former wife years ago. And I was all excited to, you know, this story. But then uh, uh, the uh, well-known uh, Dylan biographer, Clinton Halen, um, he had already got the story as well. And it made it into, I think, one of the, his second volume uh, as far as the Dylan biography, Behind the Shades. But anyway, yeah. the story is that Dylan actually got a whole, was trying to, Call Joel Selvin. This is, you know, the the San Francisco Chronicle reviewer who had written this negative review, and you know, Dylan and his band and the entourage were in San Francisco for a couple of weeks. And so, anyway, Dylan re- found his phone number, uh, I think, from the late Bill Graham, you know, the guy who produced these Warfield shows. And uh, and uh, so Joel Selvin, through a phone interview years ago, is telling me about how his former wife was home and I think he Selvin was maybe teaching at a community college or something and 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 she she didn't know who this guy was and he just was saying something trying to figure out, you know, what 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 Joel Selvin was up to and you know what was his problem more or less and and he and he said to his wife, um, well tell him I think he needs to have his license revoked, you know, writing about me anyway. And so what's hilarious is uh, this this story sounds so unlikely and crazy. However, um, a radio interview that Dylan did, uh, you know, the following year, he was talking about this San, these San Francisco reviewers, and he used that phrase that he thinks some of these journalists should get their license revoked. You know, of course, there's no license to to write, you know, music reviews in a newspaper, and Dylan knew that, but, you know, it, it's kind of his humorous way of saying he wasn't wasn't thrilled with, you know, some of the coverage or whatever, so, um, you know, that was, uh, that was a big thing, but um, if you have time, I don't, it, it's not that long, it, it'll be worth it, but when you said, like, the reaction of, say, rock critics or fans, I just found this out, uh, you know, this guy who from as a british fellow born in uh his name's Simon Napier Bell and uh he managed uh, uh a bunch of people from Jimmy Page to T-Rex to George Michael to Sinead O'Connor but anyway and right about this time period or it, definitely this time period he was working at CBS Records 
and uh you know he's Dylan's generation, so he's about forty years old at the time working at c b s and he recounted in a two thousand and eight piece uh, uh these words so so here he is in his late sixties this guy Simon Napier Bell, and he's recalling being at c b s records and this is right around the slow train time, and he says this he says quote uh, the company was being run, he's talking about CBS Records, was being run by two lawyers, Walter Yetnikoff, if I pronounce that, and Dick Asher. I liked Walter, but fell into the half of the company run by Dick Asher, a very dull man indeed. I finally got a meeting with him, but had no sooner arrived in his office than the buzzer sounded, and his secretary's voice said, Bob Dylan on line one. Can I call him back, Dick asked. No, he says he wants to talk to you now. Dick was about to have a conversation he didn't want. Eighteen months previously, previously there had been publicity about Jewish-born Dylan becoming a born-again Christian. He had made a couple of albums full of evangelical zeal, but they had bombed. Now his contract had come up for renewal. Dick especially didn't want to have this conversation in front of me. He took the call anyway. To begin with, it wasn't too interesting, but then Dick suddenly yelled down the phone, quote, I've told you, Bob, no, and I'll just use the word effing, uh, no effing religion. If you can't agree to that, the deal's off. Bob was arguing the point, but Dick was having none of it. This is Dick Asher again, according to Simon Napier Bell. Look, I'm telling you, there will be no effing religion, not Christian, not Jewish, not Muslim, nothing. For God's sakes, man, you were born Jewish, which makes your religion money, doesn't it? So stick with it, for Christ's sake. I'm giving you 20 million bucks. It's like baptizing you, like sending you to heaven. So what are you effing moaning about? You want 20 million bucks from us? Well, you got to do what we tell you. And what we're telling you is, no Torah, no Bible, no Koran, no Jesus, no God, no Allah, no effing religion. It's going in the contract, end quote. And then the Simon Napier Bell, this memory of his from working at CBS, he says at the, he says at the end of quoting Dick Asher, he says, As a devout atheist, I could hardly object, though it seemed tough that a contract should include such specific restrictions. So anyway, that was a bit of a long quote, but I just ran across and I thought that was a perfect mix between Dylan's fans at the time and the and the critics because this this was a guy who was working, you know, for no less than Dylan's record label at the time. And so that just kind of shows you right there uh of the resistance, you know, that Dylan was experiencing uh in that time. And uh, so, yeah, that that was crazy when I just ran across that very recently. Well, the opposition, as I was reading your book, which I recommend to everybody, um, Bob Dylan, A Spiritual Life, Scott M. Marshall. Um, I found it was a real page turner. I recommend it highly. Um, the opposition became even worse. Um, you know, the, he was preaching at the Warfield Theater and um, – you know, like you had mentioned the liner notes to Biograph and in that he said, you know, on these tours, people had spit at the backup singers. You know, they were yelling some vile things at them. Um, and it's funny, though, when you listen to the, the tapes of the shows, you know, and it's become a box set recently, too. When I listen to the bootlegs, just taking the music as gospel music, it was fine music. Um, for a second, could well, I don't mean to limit you in time. We have plenty of time. But I just mean, before I get it more into the opposition, could you just speak to the music itself? And were these shows valid musically, in your opinion? Right. No, I mean, there. it's it's true that, the, you know, at the time, like when I mentioned that Joel Selvin review from the San Francisco Chronicle, when Dylan was doing those two weeks of shows, it was p picked up pretty early on, the parallels between, you know, Dylan's so-called going electric in the mid-60s, which encountered some opposition and controversy and there's whole books written on that uh in this period which was you know just about 15 little less than 15 years later and there's no doubt it's a natural parallel because in terms of Dylan's uh roughly 
60 year public career, uh, there's no doubt that those two time frames were uh, pretty con controversial. And the parallel, though, is, is Dylan, just as great as Dylan is in terms of his uh, what he does and his gifts, he was surrounded. Uh, these war, the, this 79, this so called gospel period, as well as the electric days, he was surrounded by, you know, a crack band. And I know in, you know, 79, 80, I mean, from his singers, Regina McCrary, and, uh, you know, she was one of them. He had several singers, and then to, to Spooner Oldham, you know, on the keyboards and Jim Keltner drums, Tim, the late Tim Drummond on bass and Fred Hackett on guitar. Uh, Willie Smith, I believe his name as well, uh, eventually was helping out on keyboards too, but just an incredible band. And, you know, I've, he I've heard it said a number of times by people who, you know, say that they're atheists, but they, they, they do not deny the, the, the power of the of the music just in terms of how Dylan was, you know, he was fully invested. I mean, the people who, whether at the time or now, think he was, you know, faking it or it was some publicity stunt, that's, that's, that's you know, bogus. He, this was uh, him uh, singing and performing uh, at one of the, you know, it's it's basically fondly remembered. Well, well let's put it this way. it It's given more... Uh, credit now than it was back back then but but like you said the tapes have borne it out even those who were following along the way that these were some pretty uh incredible shows and as as i read in your book and it was more in depth than i'd ever heard before could you speak to the fact that he actually received death threats right this was uh this was according to Dave Kelly, and I haven't, you know, I'll be honest, I haven't heard this elsewhere, but if you think about it, that's a pretty private, intense uh, uh, situation. Uh, but Dave Kelly, for those who don't know, he was this figure in Dylan's life, and a very important figure, I would argue, for just a year or two in Dylan's life during this season. And he basically came on as one of Dylan's employees, and he was a... a a believer in Jesus and he was a, a blues guitar player, you know, and Dylan was aware of his music and I'm not sure how they got connected, but he's Dave Kelly uh, is British. And, and, you know, at the time uh, I know this guy named Chris Cooper, uh, he, he first tracked down Dave Kelly and, and heard this story back, I think in 1987 and Dave Kelly I just didn't hear his voice anywhere for a while. Not long before I got a hold of him for this book, he had given another interview for some online publication out of the UK. But he's the one who tells the death threat story and more or less was saying that these death threats did come. And, you know, Dylan had a certain amount of security uh, anyway, but that, uh, you know, that it took, he basically was just saying about how, you know, it took some some courage to just get up and do what he did, you know, uh, con considering everything. And I can't, unfortunately, I can't remember the details now, but but I would, let's put it this way, from from what I can understand, Dave Kelly is a, a very credible source. Uh, and uh, so, well, there he was you have it. I mean, the record, he had his own music career. Um, what's that? In your book, like, you know, you go into how he had his own career with the band Ark. And that, right. uh, listen to that album and uh, respected him. And he had been signed. He won a talent contest in Britain. And I believe Peter Asher for Apple signed him to the label. Right. And if I'm not mistaken, Dylan loaned out, you know, his gospel tour band I just mentioned earlier. He loaned out, I don't know if that's the right phrase for it, but I know that uh that that his Dylan's players you know were helping out to Kelly I can't uh remember details off the hot, top of my head but uh I think yeah, the album was called Crowning of a Simple Man What's that I think the record was called Crowning of a Simple Man That that definitely sounds familiar you got it that's I have not se seen that in a while but that that's it and it's funny, you said, how did they get connected? It's, um, 
you know, I don't mean it to name drop, but a close friend of mine was Mike Canfield. He was a man of faith and, and a researcher and writer. And um, I became friends with him not knowing he knew Dylan. And, you know, he told me some stories, and I think this one's okay to repeat. I kind of kept him close to the vest, but since you brought that up, uh, Mike Canfield introduced, I believe, uh, you know, brought him into the fold. And uh, Dylan had said to Mike, you know, even the crew, you know, he we, had, we were friends, and he was telling me anecdotes. And, you know, I, I held him close to my vest, but it's not, a, you know, it's not a gossipy story. But Dylan had said to him, uh, you know, the crew have to be Christians. Like, I need people I can rely on. And he sent Mike out to look for some people. And I believe, you know, according to Kelly, that was the way he was recruited was through Mike Canfield. He also had been down, you know, in the churches in that area and, the, and in the Vineyard uh, Fellowship. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I, I think I remember Dave Kelly just saying that it was, you know, that he was, I think he served as, you know, someone who could just, uh, you know, I, I think that there's no doubt there's that con musical connection, right? That they both, uh, you know, their gifts they were employing in terms of, uh, you know, music and songs and stuff, but also just the intersection of, you know, Dylan coming to faith and, and Jesus. And, and here Dave Kelly was uh, someone who could, you know, just be by his side and, uh, and encourage him and also just maybe serve as a buffer to a lot of, I, you know, he, like always Dylan is, you know, he's sought after by whether it's medias of, or excuse me, members of the press or, you know, total strangers or, uh, who, who knows who's coming out of the woodwork. But yeah, Dave Kelly was definitely, uh, an important, uh, person in that, that season, that pretty, uh, turbulent season to say the least in Dylan's career well when you brought up the threats you know when we talked talked about that just now Mike had told me that when he went down to you know Dylan's large recording complex rehearsal hall mm -hmm. that um, you know they were sitting around and um, discussing some of that and Dylan um, said do you want to see some of these letters you know fan letters and Mike said yes, and Dylan rang for his secretary, and he told her, you know, something akin to bring down the, you know, this file. And the file was all hate letters. <laughs> and, you know, he was saying Dylan was surprised that, um, you know, some people wrote and called him a Nazi and were saying, like, you know, and he's saying all I'm doing is following, you know, Jesus because that's where my life has led me. It's like my experience, and, you know, can you believe they're calling me a Nazi? So it sort of goes, you know, along with the vitriol that you had described. And I bring it up because it's in text, you know. And, um, yeah, but Mike was, was there, and he brought Kelly in, and that was the way he described uh, some of the hate mail that Dylan had been getting. But I think wow. Robert has some questions for you, too, so let's go over to him. Right. No, I I think just, uh, you know, where he could – where he did receive encouragement, uh, I'm thinking he – appreciate it because there was uh all kinds yeah i'd not heard that that story it doesn't surprise me but that is that's more insight just into you know to to what he was facing because it just needs to be said i mean you know it, you know for someone who is jewish to embrace jesus as as creator as messiah i mean you automatically put yourself in terms of uh into an extreme minority and so of course dylan a public figure he he definitely uh shuns the term celebrity but you know you know he's such a uh incredible public figure i mean by that point you know he had been in the public eye almost two decades and you know for him to be coming out as like he did there was certainly a price to pay and it with dylan's personality i think most people who know anything about him know that you know he's not to be and that ron wood of the rolling stones he saw one of these gospel shows. It was Santa Monica Civic after the Warfield shows in San Francisco and Santa Monica, California. And he said that he just uh, he could tell Dylan. You know, there was some some yelling from the crowd. You know, sing the old songs, sing the old songs. And Ron Wood, here he was, one of Dylan's uh, you know friends, basically, and uh, fellow musician. He he could tell Dylan wasn't to be tampered with. Is the words he used because uh you know when dylan's going to do something 
you know, he, he's going to do it. And this, this was, uh, this was very personal too. This was, yes, there was artistry involved, whether you loved it or didn't like it musically, but, but it, it was, it was deeply personal. And he just, uh, you know, that idea of a poet being naked and vulnerable, uh, this was, this was to me anyway, it seems like this was the a watershed moment. Okay, I think Warren has some questions, so we'll hand it over to him. Thank you, Bulldog. Um, Scott, Bob Dylan seems to uh, also explored his uh, Jewish roots at this time. Uh, why did some people have to label him uh, on one side of the camp or the other? Uh, they don't seem uh, mutually exclusive to from a singer's point of view. Right. No, Dylan, I mean, there was an interview he gave in 81, so at the tail end of this so-called gospel period where he was asked about, you know, his embrace of Jesus and his earlier interest in traveling to Israel, which he did in the late 60s and early 70s, in terms of his his Judaism, his Jewish roots. And, and he said, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but this is an 81 interview, he said he didn't see any difference between any of it in his mind you know, as far as it being incompatible. And again, this goes to this extreme minority uh, point of view where the vast majority of Jews do not believe Jesus to be, you know, God, creator, Messiah. And Dylan, you know, like, for example, you know, and got to serve somebody from slow train coming. I mean, you know, this album that introduced his faith in, in Jesus, I mean, that that song itself is from a Hebrew scriptures, you know, from the book of Joshua, choose this day whom you will serve. Uh, and then the saved album, his next album, 1980, you know, inside the album sleeve, there's a scripture passage from, from Jeremiah, again, the Hebrew scriptures. And it says, I scratched this down earlier cause I'd forgotten about this, but as it is written, you know, it basically says, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, uh, uh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And so this, you know, Dylan had put on the inside sleeve of saved. So some people uh, would say, well, a Jewish Christian, that's like saying, you know, a Democrat Republican, right? Uh, to some people's minds, it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but to Dylan, you know, uh, in terms of this, you know, these albums and what he was communicating uh, there was no, you know, he had his Jewish roots. He wasn't denying those. And he had had this experience uh, with Jesus. And he uh, he just kind of laid it all out there, right? Mm -hmm. um, the album Infidels uh, seems to have uh, biblical references throughout the album. But some said this was not an album of faith. What do you think about uh, looking back on that uh, today? Right. Well, just I don't. It's funny how that evolved. You know, I mentioned earlier I had just got became aware of Dylan's music in the mid '80s. So this Infidels came out in 1983, and so at the you know when I look back on it, you know I see just the album title Infidels, right? You know, so maybe. Mm -hmm. Some people were just thinking, well, you know, infidels, is this, is this him moving away from faith? Who knows? And I think it was an outtake from an interview Dylan did around the time. And when he was asked about the album title, and he, I think he said something like, you know, what, you know, what, what do people want to, you know, call, you know, what, what do people want to be called? You know, I could have called the, the, the album Animals, you know, he said something like that. And I just, I had to chuckle at that. But I mean, for example, one of the songs on the album is called Man of Peace. It's basically a song about Satan. I mean, it's very clear in the lyrics. And, you know, we're introduced to Satan through Jesus in the New Testament. And, uh, you know, and also, but I will say this, uh, there's certainly, there was a return, you could argue, to ambiguity in infidels. You know, because a lot of people, whether then or now, didn't like some of the black and white nature of, say, Slow Train Coming or Saved, and Infidels, uh, you know, provided, uh, 
you know, some ambiguity. For example, the title, you know, Joker Man, the title track's a perfect example. You know, who is Joker Man? What does this mean? But, I mean, on the other hand, there, there's no ambiguity. A couple songs come to mind. Union Sundown is, I mean, it's about the demise of unions in America. It's very clear. And then there's another tune, uh, Neighborhood Bully. It's about Israel. And uh, and there's no question about it. And so, so that... that but there's definitely, again, for for P, if, if if you're not familiar with the Bible, both the Hebrew Scriptures and the so-called New Testament, then you'll miss definitely a lot of direct and indirect allusions on that on that album. Wow, well, interesting stuff here. Um, on Dylan's records after Infidels, uh, do you see the uh, the Bible reflected in any of them? Oh boy, yes. I mean, you know, I mentioned earlier that that minister, the late Bert Cartwright. You know, I I think yeah, his first book was 1985, but by 1992 he had updated it, which went through Dylan's 1990 album Under the Red Sky, and so he went back to documenting you know those biblical references, and uh, there were plenty post infidels, uh, again direct and indirect, and not. Again, not saying that every single song is is just about you know biblical allusions, whether direct or indirect. There were, there were other sentiments expressed as well. But I do know in 2004, uh, Michael Gil, Gilmore, if I'm pronouncing his last name right, he's a New Testament professor somewhere in Canada, and he wrote a book called Tangled Up in the Bible, which uh, was doing a close look, kind of in the spirit of Cartwright in terms of looking at scriptural references in Dylan's work and so so there's definitely there's no question that yeah post infidels uh, what what had happened in the previous two decades of Dylan's career you know subsequent you know would been what I guess you know what let's see 30 you know over 35 years since infidels and it's uh yeah it's 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 still there no doubt about it right um, I'm sure you just don't just uh, throw that away. Um, if it's in you, it's in you. Um, I got one more last question, and then I'll hand it back to the Bulldog. Uh, of the Christian songs, which which stand out to you the most and why? Well, I'd say the earlier reference, Got to Serve Somebody, you know, the opening track off Slow Train Coming, just because, you know, that's the song that, you know, the even though I was a kid listening to probably uh, the Bee Gees maybe at the time in middle school, you know, here Dylan was on Saturday Night Live debuting his songs from Slow Train on Saturday Night Live and Serve Somebody uh, was the first tune. And then on to those Warfield shows in San Francisco where that was the opening song. And... You know, even to 2003, this "Got to Serve Somebody" tribute album came out, where some mostly traditional gospel artists were covering Dylan's "Slow Train Coming" and "Save" songs, and uh, and even to this, you know, this past year when Dylan, the last couple of years, Dylan's been including the "Serve Somebody" in his in his set list. So it's just, you know, it's just endured. It's been around for over 40 years. Dylan's still tinkering with its lyrics and actually has some pretty in, intriguing uh, recent rewrites to the lyrics. And anyway, another song, In the Garden, Dylan doesn't sing it as much as Serve Somebody, but uh, but it's but it, but it's it uh, lasted beyond the so-called gospel period. And it's, it's just a straight out account of uh, Jesus through the New Testament, you know, the New Testament accounts. And even fairly recently in an interview when Dylan was asked, and this happened, this was in the last few years, he was asked, which of your songs do you think, you know, don't get maybe overlooked or underappreciated? Something like that, the interviewer asked. And he referenced Brownsville Girl, which is an incredibly, uh, incredible song, epic song. But then he also mentioned In the Garden, you know, from his Saved album. I mean, Dylan didn't say it was from his Saved album, but that's where it's from. And so, and then finally, I just say every grain of sand. I mean, that's a tune from Shot of Love that, you know, people, uh, you know, if, if someone was forced to make one of the, those top 10 lists, to me, it's just, there's no question that that's a top 10 Dylan tune. And it's not, 
you know, it's not from the 1960s, <laughs> but even, right. I mean, there, so if someone would not put that song on their list, I think they would either be unaware of it or maybe had forgotten about it. But that, that song, you know, uh, is an incredibly, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to put that one into words, but that's, uh, that definitely, that, that song stands out. Well, I think Johnny stuff. Cash, if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Johnny Cash, requested that would be it is uh um, among the songs at his funeral well i didn't know that that's interesting all right well i'm going to hand it back to bulldog and it's all yours bulldog well um you know this is like uh usually a Beatles show but the dylan ones the Beatle fans usually overlap with a lot of dylan but um i gotta ask you because it was interesting in the book when dylan was getting ready he came into san francisco He's going to play at the Warfield, and George Harrison was supposed to have dinner with him. And uh, can you tell us that story and what happened with that? Right. I don't. Unfortunately, I'm on the road. I don't have the. I don't have my interview transcript with me. But again, going back to Dave Kelly, this is uh, the source of this story, and my understanding is. You know, I think Harrison, I don't know if Harrison, George Harrison was already in the area or or what, but I know that he and Dylan had planned on linking up. And remember oh, this again. Just to refresh, because it's your story that I, you know, got from your book, but I just read it today, so I bring, you know, some of it again. But Harrison was checked into the hotel and then checked out. Okay. Yeah, I just remember him saying that he just wondered, and I know I could tell Dave Kelly was – was speculating, but it kind of make it, you know, I, I just think it might be one of those things where, you know, they were, they, they respected one another and they were, they were friends and maybe it was just something, uh, I think most people know that George Harrison was uh, a spiritual man, no doubt about it. Uh, and, but what this turn Dylan had, had taken, maybe it was just one of those things where in that moment, uh, he wanted to, to avoid, uh, whatever was happening i don't i don't know details but yet uh yeah they were apparently to link up and they didn't but i do know you know this was 79 but i do know by you know 1988 the traveling wilburys were you know this this group and and so you, you got to figure after that warfield whatever happened there i figured that dylan and harrison whether it was by phone or or letter or maybe in person you know they I, I would assume they they uh, had some, you know, had had some correspondence before the travel between the Warfield and Traveling Wilburys, but but I do know like by '92, when Dylan that there was that there was this concert that was at Madison Square Garden, celebrating 30 years of Dylan being on the Columbia label, and anyway, a bunch of artists came right, and Harrison was one of them, and he introduced when Dylan came on stage, at, you know, he introduced Dylan by saying something, some of you may call him Bobby, some of you may call him Zimmy. And so he was even referencing Dylan's got to serve somebody from that, from that time period, you know? And so, uh, so, so that I definitely, in, in terms of the Beatles, yeah, Dylan and Harrison, no question about it, were the closest. And uh, I guess at the time when he checked out of the hotel, the implication was that he didn't want to be witness to yeah, I, I I wouldn't surprise me. I mean, Dylan was whether it was his producer Jerry Wexler, you know, who did Slow Train, who uh, was fond of calling himself a Jewish atheist, or whether it was uh, you know the people in the audience, you know, that came to see Dylan at that time, uh, or Tim Drummond actually, the late Tim Drummond, the famous bass player. I mean, he played for James Brown, Aretha Franklin, a bunch of Neil Young, you know, all these people, and when he toured with Dylan during the gospel tours, uh, I interviewed him and he told me that, you know, Dylan was saying, Hey, why don't you come and join us? You know, these, these prayers that, uh, you know, that he'd get Dylan would gather with his singers and others, you know, for prayers before some of these shows. And, uh, Tim Drummond just chuckled and said he and a couple other people were the outlaws who didn't necessarily, you know, uh, engage in that. And so, yeah, it could have been, it could have been Harrison, uh, I don't know, actually. I, I just don't know, but it is an interesting, uh, interesting story in terms of just the the two of them being, to, you know, in the same same city of San Francisco during that time. 
Now, I'm um, going to sneak a question in. We talked about George. Can you tell us a little bit about John Lennon and, and Dylan's Christian period and any thoughts that come to your mind about John Lennon when the two things are brought up at the same time? Right. Well, you know, they just serve somebody, uh, or I mean, excuse me, serve yourself that John Lennon wrote, and it was a, it was a demo, and I think by the late 80s, after his passing, it was it was included on a compilation, but you know, I, I think, you know, I'm pretty sure I read somewhere, read somewhere that, you know, Lennon was watching Saturday Night Live, you know, I referenced earlier right there where he was living uh, and heard those songs, you know, on Saturday Night Live. I'm assuming, uh, don't know for certain, but I'm assuming he uh, was aware of Slow Train coming to album, which had come out, you know, a couple months earlier. And, you know, I... It's come to light. Uh, I do know Steve Turner, uh, the, the British author and poet, who's written a number of books, and uh, he wrote a book called The Gospel According to the Beatles, published in 2006. Anyway, but he pieced together some interesting anecdotes about uh, John Lennon having apparently a born-again season that did, did not last according to Turner because of the influence of Yoko Ono but that he you know because of his public just because of you know he wasn't able to go out without being just you know accosted I guess by just you know fans because of his celebrity he I think it's known by most that he was could tend to be reclusive there and and anyway he was watching TV preachers as it turns out and and there's just uh some evidence um, from a couple different sources that uh, that you know he was he was doing this at the at the time and uh, you know had had and this was just I think in '77 you know there was and so so when, in his last interview if I'm not mistaken in Playboy magazine you know he he ref you know he's asked about Dylan you know because Dylan's Slow Train coming album you know had come out and Saved was out as well and you know he's he actually has some empathy for Dylan and he and he was pretty respectful in that interview so a lot of times it's just kind of written off oh Lennon wrote this song serve yourself which just parodied parody uh Dylan's uh you know what Dylan was up to at the time but uh you know uh some some digging around shows that that Lennon was you know he was he was certainly uh curious about the the figure of Jesus and uh and he, you know, there was something, you know, he attended some, with his son, some Easter service. You know, there's this whole st back story that I'm not, unfortunately, I don't have, uh, on, you know, I don't have it right there in front of me. But it's it's definitely, it's definitely out there. Well, that's pretty interesting, you know, given the perception. But we had spoke to Jude Sutherland Kessler many times on the shows. And, you know, I heard this song, it's up on YouTube, to, uh, John had written Help Me to Help Myself, which is obviously a Christian song. And Jude said there were other ones like Crossing the Jordan. And it seemed like he might have been trying to compile a Christian album. She said there were like six songs that used to be up that were taken down off YouTube for whatever reason I could speculate. But uh, I always thought that was interesting because it's almost like somebody's trying to cover that up. Uh, be it a record label or possibly Yoko Ono, I don't know. But... um you know, I liked another part of your book very much, and, and my friend Andy Muir had, had gotten some of these songs to me because I loved them so much. But Dylan was singing many traditional hymns in concerts, such as Rock of Ages, which I think once he called his favorite hymn or his favorite song. Uh, can you talk a little bit about when he was playing those songs um, at the shows? And it seems like if somebody had repu repudiated, not repudiated, excuse me, Christianity, they wouldn't be singing songs like Rock of Ages and, uh, you know, Hallelujah, I'm Ready to Go. Can you talk a little bit about those songs on that, that tour in that period? Sure, right. I, I remember I was in graduate school at the time, and I was one of these odd characters that, ch you know, I checked the Dylan set list just out of curiosity, you know, what's, what's Dylan up to on the latest tour type of thing. And anyway, in early 99, he uh, debuted the song uh, Rock of Ages, the old hymn, and uh, I had forgotten that, but what you just said, you're right. He was asked, I think it was 
in a Rolling Stone interview or somewhere he was asked in more recent years, if I think the question was something like, you know, if you had to listen to a song, you know, on your deathbed or something, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that was the song he chose, Rock of Ages, but it's, uh, but yeah, that song in Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, which was written by Fanny Crosby, this blind woman who wrote ton, who just wrote tons of songs, and, you know, Dylan, around this same time frame, introduced that song as well, and you know, I I think, and you mentioned Hallelujah, I'm Ready to Go, and there's another one called I Am the Man Thomas, which talks about the, the doubting Thomas of Scripture of the New Testament, who, uh, when it was reported by his peers that Jesus had risen from the dead, he, he didn't believe it. He And uh, he, he had to see the scar, he had to see the, the risen Christ himself. And so anyway, this tune, I Am the Man Thomas, is is literally written from the first person perspective of Jesus, and uh, it's it was written by Ralph Stanley, the the bluegrass legend, along with Larry Sparks. And so, I would say these hymns, you know, or whether like Hallelujah, I'm ready to go. I'm pretty sure is a traditional song. We don't know who who penned those words, but but all these songs, you know, were, were in, kind of in the bluegrass uh, in terms. Of if you listen to the performances of them, uh, they were. You know, at the time, you know, Dylan had just uh, recorded with Ralph Stanley, actually, a couple of years before. I think it was 97. And But the interesting thing is, you know, we know with Dylan, because of his personal experience, it's, you know, some people can sing, of course, gospel songs, whether it's bluegrass or, uh, say, Peter, Paul, and Mary singing gospel songs back in the day. But it doesn't necessarily mean someone's, you know, personally connected to uh, to the Christian story, but with Dylan, we had obviously 20 years earlier. But anyway, I do remember this woman who's uh, Jewish, who's also a believer in Jesus, named Ronnie Cohane. She 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 argued that time out of mind. You know, a couple of years before he brought out these songs, started sprinkling sprinkling them throughout his concerts. That time out of mind was like a kind of a believer's blues album, like you know, the blues in regard to you know, just as life unfolds, right? Even if you have faith in God that, uh, you know, things don't always go according to plan. There's, there's pain, there's, there's, there's suffering. And, uh, you know, she, she, she made an interesting case in terms of that, uh, that album. And, uh, also by the way, you know, 99, 2000, when he was including some of these new songs that were to me anyway, just reflected, the sentiments of slow train coming and saved uh within a, a year or two he was in a studio with mavis staples right of all people uh bringing a rewritten version of uh one of his so- songs from slow train coming and again it's this this went to this got to serve somebody tribute cd this guy jeff gaskill produced it it's a great cd and you know dylan ended up uh, contributing something to it, and to me, that's it's a highly significant because, like you said earlier, if somebody, if Dylan had uh, renounced Jesus, as some rumors had it, or had you know returned to Judaism, as in no longer believing Christ to be Messiah, Creator, then why in the world, say in 2002, would he uh, lend his name uh, and performance to? Uh, to this tribute CD to his songs from Slow Train Coming and Save, right? Just doesn't make any sense. And and he, even on Theme Time Radio Hour, Dylan's radio show, he, there was something I heard the other day where he was talking about, you know, it's just always better when you believe in something if you're singing it. You know, you, you can you can tell. You know, you can you can hear it and feel it. Uh, those are my words. But he he was talking about just. Uh, and and he's mentioned that more than more than once. But uh so anyway, so yeah, that that uh and oh by the way, what I would say too is that these that Gotta Serve Somebody tribute album, I think my opinion was that, you know, that time frame of Slow Train Coming and Save, there was a lot of opposition, a lot of discouragement. Not that it, that was all there was, but it wasn't appreciated at the time and so fast forward a couple decades and what Jeff Gaskill did with these some of these gospel artists, you know, uh were 
honoring Dylan's songs, and I think that meant a lot to him. And I mean, he, you know, he contributed, he rewrote uh, "Going to Change My Way of Thinking" a slow train tune f- for that album. It's it's uh, with Mavis Staples. It's kind of a, I guess you could call it like a blues. There's some blues and gospel and rock all all in there. And he updated the lyrics a bit, a uh, bit, right? He did, indeed, he did, right? Just like we've got to serve somebody in the last year or two, he uh, working with those lyrics and rewriting them as well. You know, if I can tell a story that happened to me, I was doing an interview with Charlie Daniels, and I, you know, I've been told I can do basically whatever I want. You know, very the magazine was very happy with me. And when I was talking to Charlie Daniels, his, um, you know, Charlie's a man of faith. And he had a new album, you know, Dylan Off the Grid, you know, where he was covering uh, all songs of Bob Dylan. And he played on, you know, a few of Dylan's albums, I believe three. But I said to him, you know, what do you think of Dylan, Dylan's, you know, viewpoint going due north? You know, meaning up in the sky, you know, when he when he came to God. And uh, Ch- Charlie Daniels said, you know, he was really happy about that. And he didn't know Dylan's background. And he was glad he came to the Lord. And um, to like one quote in an article, you know, and it's relevant. Dylan was playing with him on, you know, albums, and he had a new album out. Um, you know, as I said, Dylan Off the Grid is a really good covers that Charlie Daniels does. And from that one, you know, little two sentence or one sentence in the article, I got an email saying, don't do another interview unless you submit every question beforehand. So I no longer, you know, wrote, I think that was the last article I did for that magazine. But, uh, you know, evidently, even that one little quote, like you could write anything and that one seemed to still shake things up so much. Uh, so I just wow. want to sneak that in. You know, uh, it was it really stunned me. But, but wow. Charlie was, was very, um, you know, interested in that. And I talk, got to talk to him a little bit about uh, Tempest later, you know, after the interview was over. And I said, you know, this one this one seems to be all about the book of Revelation. And he hadn't heard it yet, and he wrote down the album title like he was going to listen to it. But I was wondering what you thought of of Tempest. Yeah, well, Charlie Daniels, just to, now that you mentioned him, I mean, right, he he and Dylan, I mean, you know, he he's free he's freely acknowledged for a long time, even though he's Dylan senior by a few years, I believe that he greatly appreciates, you know, uh, Dylan giving him. Uh, that session work on those albums because that uh, that encouraged him greatly and all that he did afterward and pretty sure somewhere in Chronicles D- Dylan's memoir he mentions uh, Charlie Daniels and uh, yeah I think he respects he respects Charlie Daniels and they they certainly uh, uh, share share the faith but but Tempest I mean you know the thing about Tempest is it's a pretty you know bloody album in many ways and I know that. Uh, whether you're a critic of the Bible or a, uh, or someone who believes it's uh, the inspired Word of God, it's hard to deny that, that the book is bloody in more than one way, right? And, you know, Paid in Blood, a song off that album, you know, this, this song, you know, Dylan sings Paid in Blood, uh, but not my own. You know, what does that mean? Something's paid in blood and... But it's not Dylan's own blood, or you know. It's pretty but, overt uh, to me. Like when they say overt, I was pr- pretty sure. And not to inter- I don't mean to interrupt you. I guess I don't want to say I'm not interrupting you. I am. I apologize. But re- one of the lines right in the song is he. They talk about the Watchmen. You know, it's all along the Watchtower, it goes back to the Old Testament, the Watchmen of the City. And he's saying he read the Book of Revelation and it filled his cup with tears. So what is the record about? I mean, he's saying he read the book of Revelation, and I believe the rest of the line is he, you know, filled his cup with tears from memory. I mean, to me, that's sort of like there's no skating around. That. Am I wrong? No, right. That that from yeah, that song about the Titanic. You know, I, I believe it was the hundred year anniversary when Tempest was released, and you know, we I read rumors, you know, online something about how there'd be a song about. The Titanic and a song about John Lennon on this forthcoming Dylan album, but yeah, I have that scratched down. Just that that Tempest song, uh, the title track. You know, it includes yeah a reference to the Book of Revelation, 
And oftentimes when Revelation, when Dylan has referred to Revelation lyrically, it's, you know, it's been from some scripture passage within it. But yeah, here he just, in that song, just mentions the book of Revelation. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I... I, I, I mid '80s. I remember him giving an interview and 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 saying that you know he believed that basically that ever since the Garden of Eden, you know, that the world had been heading a certain way, and that the that it's all there in the Book of Revelation. But he was basically saying a lot of people don't want to don't want to hear it, you know, uh, type of thing. But uh, but that yeah, I mean, even in you know, Roll On John, uh, which you know, I've I've read some accounts that say this could be operated on on a number of levels but but there's no question that it's uh at least to me it's a heartfelt homage to you know John Lennon and there's more than one allusion in that song to biblical language and and figures within within that song uh long and wasted years is another song that I would put at least personally that is just to me when I first heard that it's got such incredible uh, uh, emotional appeal and it's, it's just a very it, it's a disarming song it's very simple but profound and that yeah the tempest album is the is the last at least currently it's been i guess what seven years or so since it was released and it's his last album of uh original compositions and and i haven't done any you know count or anything but uh you know going back to the biblical illusions uh there's just yet a lot more within you know within that album direct and indirect well i thought early roman kings was also like if someone doesn't know the bible like i could see how they wouldn't grasp that and by the grace of god i've been able to you know read at least what i can understand of it but i mean early roman kings is saying uh you know in their you know he's He's explaining people in coffins, meaning dead souls, in their top hats, you know, in suits and shark skin boots. These are bankers. And he's saying, like, they'll destroy you. They'll destroy your town. And, I mean, the whole song to me read like, it's like, it's like they don't have singles anymore. But if Dylan had a single, I think early Roman Kings would have been in. It would have been the first single I heard that was describing what, you know, some people term as the deep state or the new world order or something like that. Well, he certainly likes the song because, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I've noticed that's been in, you know, been in his concerts, uh, uh, in the set list. It seems like every every evening when he's been playing shows in recent times. Absolutely, I, I and many for a long time the shows were mostly filled with songs from Tempest, even though he didn't seem to be speaking much and and you know giving a rap. But he, we said something that you stressed in your book at one point, the line from, I think, Thunder on the Mountain, where he says, I already confessed, no need to confess again. It's kind of like saying, I told you, it's still in my songs, but, you know, dust your feet off and walk away because you spit at us, you mocked us, you ripped us in the press. You know, like you had alluded to, um, you know, his career, was it was anything but a ploy to get Christian attention because he needed a record. If anything, it almost destroyed his career. I mean, mm -hmm. he's still Bob Dylan. If he went back to singing the old songs, he's going to be able to play somewhere. But I mean, later he'd be playing with the Grateful Dead in stadiums. On those tours, he was having to play some really small theaters, sometimes maybe because people would hear in a small, maybe he desired a small venue. But at other times, I don't think the seats were selling well. Mm hmm No, so, I but, think, right, there's no question. I mean, that the, 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 the critical and commercial hit that his, you know, career took. And, and, you know, he, he just, by the late eighties, he just got out on the road and what's now known as the never ending tour, you know, has been, I read somewhere online line recently in the last 30 plus years, you know, he's done over 3000 shows and he's just, uh, he certainly, you know, I have no idea how he's managed his money, but uh, presumably he certainly doesn't need uh, the money. The man is nearly 80 years old, and he still seems like he's still doing 80 to 100 shows a year. You know, uh, he uh, he has to love what he does. Absolutely, and I just wanted to mention it because he was a friend of mine, and he passed away. 
But another thing, I'm just remembering Mike Canfield as we talk because of what we're talking about. And uh, I really, you know, I love the guy. He was a real good person. And uh, he could be a tough cookie, but, uh, you know, he was a great author. And, and uh, you know, he, he told me some great stories. And he even said, like, when Dylan went through that stuff, that was where I got the phrase. He said, you know, Dylan was one, you know, tough cookie. Like, he put up with the abuse and he could take it. You know, but when he did share those letters, he was hurt. You know, like, why are they saying this about me? And mm-hmm. and so one thing he said to Mike really resonated with me was, you know, Mike told me the story and he said, um, the one thing he said to him is, you know, I just want to play, meaning concerts. I just want to be out there and playing. And that was before, um, you know, preceding the, uh, the never ending tour later, which I just dropped in from my friend, Andy Muir. He has a great book about the never ending tour. And he has a new one about Dylan and Shakespeare. Um, he's been really kind to me. And it was another, aside from yours, one of my favorite books. And he's on Facebook at uh, Shakespeare Cambridge, I think he calls it. But um, uh, I, I actually a- met, I, I got to meet him briefly. And unfortunately, I, I wish I could have been able to talk to him more. But in Tulsa, Oklahoma, at this Dylan conference this past summer, uh yeah, you, you're right. He's been at it. He's written a number of books uh, on Dylan, and uh, and but but we but you know in Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, and there's not now this Dylan archives. And what I'd be curious about is when you mentioned earlier that that mail that he received during that time. I mean, uh, I'm certain he's received mail uh, throughout his career, but uh, it'd be interesting in terms of. Uh, I mean, because I, I do know there's, you know, there there's some there's some piece of mail that uh, I think Dylan wrote to someone who was an encouragement to him. And now that what you just pointed out, how there was some, which makes sense, even though I haven't heard of it, that there was also hate mail uh, involved. I just wonder in terms of it, Dylan's archives, and in, in terms of uh, him, because apparently he still finding stuff and handing stuff over uh to the to this uh, archive of his that he sold you know that's in Tulsa and I'd be uh I'd be interested just to look at cuz you know cuz you know I mean, one thing is hate mail but some of those reviews not all of them but some of those reviews of say slow train coming and saved I mean you could tell that the people or some of these people who write in the reviews it became so personal, right? I mean, they were supposed to be reviewing the music, right? And But this was such a personal affront, at least to some, uh, what Dylan was singing about. And of course, with Dylan's personality, it kind of makes sense that he would be this 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 uh, newborn uh, uh, believer who would, would uh, you know, would rub people the wrong way, kind of, you know, like, you know, that, that prophetic mode where you're not going to be winning any popularity contest and you might be uh that lone voice (laughs) crying in the wilderness so to speak and uh so anyway but that just yeah i wonder if if uh if any of any correspondence that dylan received whether it was encouraging or or if it was just the venomous stuff if that ever makes its way to the dylan's archives i don't know something like that i don't know it's just a feeling like i don't know I just know he showed it to Mike and he had it in a file and the secretary got it. But that mm-hmm. in my mind, it might be something that he held private or is holding private. But um, mm-hmm. I don't know. You know, it's, it's just that I heard that story. But I just Trouble No More came out. And I was really glad Dylan didn't take like a beating for it. But it's like a box set of the very same show. And yet now they review it in the same magazines often. And they call it like all but a masterpiece. <laughs> right. No, right. I mean, it, it, you know, it took a while to, you know, maybe it's just the, the hard feelings or the rawness of whatever the offense or offenses were at the time. But yes, I mean, I haven't read, I got to read it. I've got the, I've got the liner notes, but I know that, um, for example, Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller fame, I discovered in my research that he was a young man in his mid twenties when Dylan was playing those two weeks of shows we referenced earlier in November of 79 at the Warfield theater, you know, introducing his gospel songs and, you know, playing for two weeks there, uh, Penn Gillette, 
uh, was with was it was not Penn, they were not Penn, Penn and Teller quite yet. I think it was eighty one when they. But anyway, they were playing with this. I can't remember the name of the third guy, but they had this three man show in the Bay Area right when Dylan was playing these shows, and I knew Penn Gillette, uh besides being a famous magician now for decades, you know, is a, a proponent of atheism, right? But I also know he's a huge Dylan fan, so I was curious, you know, about how he did he happen to catch any of those shows and I contacted I think it's his manager but I got an email a few years ago saying that no Penn did not attend any of those shows um you know I was hoping to get an interview with them and I think they said or his excuse me his manager said well if you get a what do you call it? if you get a uh a book because they asked who my publisher was I didn't have one right and he said well if you get a publisher he'll help you out or something like that so I'm hoping uh, that'll still apply, but that's a roundabout way of saying that Trouble No More, the box set you referenced, Penn Gillette was one of the people who contributed liner notes to it, you know? So here's an atheist who's, what do you call it, uh, very vocal about his atheism, and yet he's he's writing notes of, uh, I don't know if uh, I should use the word praise, but he's, you know, he was called on and and he wrote... Uh, agreed to write notes, uh, and I think he can appreciate the music for what it was, even though he doesn't, you know, agree with the the, the sentiments or the theology of it. Uh, so I found that interesting, just that Penn Gillette, you know, was uh, one of the guys who contributed to the liner notes. And just before I hand over to Warren, I just had one more thought that was expressed in your book often. Dylan often will go into a rap you know, an interview and, and and speak and say, you know, I'm into the, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm into the reason, risen Jesus. It's not religion. And that was one of his hooks when he spoke to people or when he did interviews. Could you just talk about that a little, the difference between he believed in the risen Jesus, not in religion? Right. That's an interesting thing. I mean, we all know that Dylan is a, he's a word guy, right? I mean, sure. He's a musician, and he's a band leader, but, uh, you know, one thing he talked about, like, you know, a decade after Slow Train, I think it was USA Today, Edna Gunderson, who interviewed, this woman interviewed Dylan a number of times, you know, he said he didn't view those records as religious. He just, you know, had certain experience and things you run up against, and he said, you know, the word religion doesn't have any holiness to it. He said people that work for oil companies or Coca-Cola, you know, those are religions. And, you know, what he was expressing at the, at the time was uh, this very real experience, you know, where as, as he, when he, he first, you know, came forward publicly with it in a big way was, you know, basically a year and a half after it all happened roughly. And it was in the Los Angeles time where he, you know, said uh that he experienced Jesus and it was it was real and and so you know this this idea of a, a risen Christ that you know that he was he is and is to be and that Dylan experienced this uh Jesus of scripture and uh you know it just he he couldn't keep quiet about it, you know, and he, and he still, I mean, there's still that thread that is there, uh, and, you know, and, and from time to time in his interviews or like we've been talking about just directly or indirectly through, through lyrics, you know, and, and the funny thing is sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, Dylan came to Jesus because he was very vulnerable, right? You know, he had this divorce and, and he was at this low point, and he's you know vulnerable to the to to religion, right? This kind of thing. But you know, it kind of you can kind of turn it around and say, well, well, if a God exists, would this would this God not be someone who would be reaching out to people, regardless of whom they are, whether they're world famous or someone no one knows on the street, you know, at their most vulnerable when they're in pain and when they're in you know in need, and so. Uh, so yeah, well, I mean, he said he felt that something, or well, not something, but he said Jesus was in the room with him, and he felt, I think, a hand on his shoulder. I'm paraphrasing from memory, and then he said, uh, a voice, you know, said to him, "Why are you resisting me?" And he said, 
you know, I'm not resisting you or how am I resisting you? And he said, if you're not following me, you're resisting me. That was one of the accounts that I've read. Yeah, no, he, he said, I mean, it was the gospel, so-called gospel raps, you know, these little these little comments he made between songs during the gospel tours are intriguing because, yeah, in some interviews, he, he's, what you mentioned, you know, he said, but there's, you know, other times, like one of my favorites was Omaha, Nebraska, you know, January 1980. So just picture middle of America, Dylan's in the middle of these gospel tours that, you know, they're appreciated by some, but it's certainly not the, the height of his popularity. And, there's a stage rap. I'm paraphrasing, but this is pretty close to what he said between one of the song between songs. Omaha, Nebraska. He says something like, "So this is Dylan, 1980. So he's you know almost 40 years old, and he says something like, you know, people used to say I was a prophet. I'd say no, I'm not. They'd say yes, you are. I'd say no, I'm not. But now I come out and say Jesus is the answer." And then they say, no, Bob Dylan's no prophet, you know. And so just those words that he said there, to me, you know, that that's kind of like Ph.D. material. There's a lot, a, lot, a lot of depth there. Like, in other words, uh, this guy idolized, and Dylan definitely did not want to take on the mantle of a, a leader or, you know, uh, someone who was, you know, had the answer. And everyone was, not everyone, but many people were looking to him in these incredible words and songs that he created and here he is you know in his personal life coming to this very real conclusion about you know the ultimate things i mean even christopher hitchens the late atheist said that hey things about religion and is there a god is there not a god i mean is there not anything more important than this right so anyway but dylan comes to these ultimate conclusions and uh and not everyone, but there were many people that just did did not want to hear it, and uh, and so yeah, that's that's uh, sometimes his burden is more than he can bear. You know, I mean, it's well, uh, absolutely. And he also said, you know, um, as Hank Williams sang in his song, and I'm paraphrasing again, but he said, "Just say I saw the light," you know, and that's a pure gospel song that Hank Williams was singing there. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and and he's. I think he said something. You know, I've seen seen the light too. And uh, yeah, there's no there's when uh, that's the interesting thing about Dylan. There's a lot of seemingly contradictions, but you know, he's he's you know he's he's a liberal guy in some ways. He's a conservative guy in some some way, right? He's black and white guy in some ways. In some ways, he's full of ambiguity, you know. And I I think that just reflects. Uh, you know, just what it is to be human sometimes, right? That that it's not, uh, and he certainly was someone to, you know, avoid uh, labels. I remember in some interview, I think it was mid-80s he gave, where he says, you know, people call themselves, you know, Methodists, you know, whatever denominations he was saying, and he mentioned Jewish conservative reform. He goes, God don't, God don't call people that. You know, he's no, you know, and so he, he you know, I think Dylan tries tries to get down on his good days to the root of the root of what's real you know and what what's not well i just want to say i love the book um bob dylan a spiritual life by scott m marshall and i just want to read one of the quotes off the back cover by noel paul stuckey of peter paul and mary uh he said bob dylan a spiritual life succeeds mightily in documenting bobby dylan zimmerman's continuing and often misunderstood personal recollections of two face and for what it's worth i heartily agree with him and i hand over to warren thank you bob uh first of all scott i'd like to thank you for coming on the show um your book sounds like a very interesting read and i can tell you did a lot of uh, work and research on it well listen warren thank you very much i appreciate appreciate it yeah, that's no problem. Uh, like I said, I appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, Scott, can you please tell the listeners where uh, they can find your work and keep up to date with you? Okay, there's a couple guys, uh, John and Mike, that have produced this uh, thrice annual Dylan journal entitled The Bridge. 
Uh, and I'm grateful they've put in my interviews in an occasional article here and there over the years. And that's somewhere where uh, my work's published uh, somewhat regularly there. And they don't, and they do have a, a, a web presence, but in terms of articles, typically you have to, so it's more of a traditional thing where you subscribe to the magazine, get it in hand. But I do have a website, scottmmarshall.net, and uh, it's very, uh, it's a little clunky, but if you want to just look at a bibliography of things I've written that are Dylan related, it's there. And if you wanted to email me and correspond or ask a question, uh, uh, feel free, but uh, but yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, hopefully, I'll have a, a book out on the Warfield uh, theater shows of November '79. Hopefully, that'll come to pass uh, in, in the not terribly distant future. <laughs> oh, that's all. That all sounds great. Is there anything else you'd like to mention? Any books, any articles, or anything else you'd like to to add to the show? Sure, I've got, this is a little bit of a list, but I don't think it'll take too long, but I've got, let's see, four articles and three books, and there's two two of the four articles uh, online, one's called The Secrets Behind Bob Dylan's Muscle Shoals Albums, The Secrets Behind Bob Dylan's Muscle Shoals Albums, it's on AL.com, which is uh, that some Alabama, an Alabama newspaper, and this guy Matt Wake, uh, wrote this piece, and it talks about Dylan's recording of both Slow Train Coming and Saved, and for those who don't know, Muscle Shoals, uh, Northern Alabama, that's where Dylan recorded these albums. Then the second uh, article uh, is one I wrote and did some research on. It, it's it's uh, called 50 Years Ago Today, uh, a 24-year-old Bob Dylan electrifies Barton Hall, and uh, it was published by uh, the Cornell Daily Sun in 2015, and it's just uh, when Dylan, you know, he returned to do a show at uh, Cornell University in 2015, and I just look back at when he was there in the mid-60s and found some people that were at that show, and there's a piece there, and a couple pieces having to do with uh, John Lennon uh, and Oral Roberts, I would recommend. This is an intriguing uh, one's called uh, The Gospel of John Lennon, and a woman named Lindsay Neal wrote it. It's on thislandpress.com, and this land is a publication out of uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, actually where Dylan's archives are. But thislandpress.com, The Gospel of John Lennon. And then this other, finally, this article called The Beetle in the Preacher is on the or is on ORU. Oracle.com, O-R-U, Oracle.com, and the Oracle is this uh, student publication of, believe it or not, Oral Roberts University, and there's just these two articles deal with this intriguing, is there a connection between John Lennon and uh, Oral Roberts, uh, which is uh, pretty intriguing, but anyway, a few books, and I'll end with this. There's two Dylan biographies that came out in recent years, and the gentleman just passed away. But Ian Bell uh, wrote a two-volume biography on Dylan. The first volume is called Once Upon a Time. The second volume is called Time Out of Mind. But these two volumes are called The Lives of Bob Dylan, and they came out in 2013, 2014. I think he's a great writer and, and put things uh, uh, really well in these books. Um, and also Louis Kemp, Dylan went to summer camp with him as a young boy, and in terms of the whole, is Dylan a Christian or not, this is an important book because Louis Kemp, Dylan's childhood friend, became an Orthodox Jew about the same time Dylan was coming to Jesus, and they lived in the same household briefly, and Louis Kemp wrote this book uh, about his experiences of just, you know, being Dylan's friend, uh, you know, privately and in the public eye as well. And then finally, Steve Turner, who I mentioned earlier, who's uh, British, uh, an author and a poet, he wrote a book called The Gospel According to the Beatles, and it was published in 2006, where it just takes a look at the, the Beatles and where, you know, their roots and their expressions of spirituality or religion. And uh, 
I don't know, I think uh, listeners might find that was a bit of a long-winded list, but there are some articles and books right there. No, they all sound interesting to me. Uh, I appreciate that, and I sure will be looking them up. And uh, again, I'd like to thank you for being on the show. And from here, I'm going to hand it over to Bob to close out. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thanks for coming on. And, you know, when people go on a show, you know, everybody's like, well, I love your book. No, I really love the book. Um, I don't like a lot of books about Dylan. Sometimes I just look at the pictures. I like, um, you know, Andy, Andy Muir and Clinton Halen. And this book was up there with that. And it kept me from beginning to end. It's a book that I have read more than once. And I will read again from start to finish. And I think you did a great job. And thanks for coming on and speaking with us. Well, listen, thank you for inviting me. And thank you for having me. I, I enjoyed it, too. And thank you for the, the words, the kind words. And, and Merry Christmas to you and your family. And have a nice new year coming. Very hey, good. you too, Warren. And thank you, sir.